All right, welcome to our service this morning. If you would, go ahead and stand. We're going to sing our, uh, our chorus on the winning side. Jonathan's here with us today, leading the music. I don't know if he's glad, but he, what, uh, you're glad, aren't you? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Pastor Dan's got a, a whole van load of our young people up uh, there in Missouri, and uh, they're competing for the school, ACE, uh, for the national convention out there, and so we need to continue to pray for them as they're there. There's a lot of storms and stuff that's been going on out there in that area. And uh, so we just need to pray for their care and protection. They're at the, I think, the, is it the University of, of uh, Missouri that they're at? They're at a big university there. And, and uh, so uh, and we need to continue to pray for them. They'll be back at the end of this coming week. But we're glad that you're here. And, of course, this is probably the beginning of the uh, summer Vacations. We look like we have lots of people going on vacation today, but we're glad that you're here with us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we pray that you would bless in our services today. I pray, Father, that you would have your will and your way in this uh, place this morning. Thank you for these that have come. And then, dear Lord, we pray for those who are traveling, uh, Father, from our church. And then we pray specifically for Pastor Dan and those uh from our school and from our church that are traveling, Father, to the, a, the National Convention out there in Missouri. Pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. And Father, help them to have a wonderful time and bring them back to us safely. Now, uh, bless in this service today, and we commit it to you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
ahead and stand. We're going to sing a song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, uh, page number 39 in your hymnals. and uh, take this time to greet one another.
let's go ahead and sing that chorus. He is Lord. you for that. Well, praise the Lord. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, good to see Eric here and his dear wife. We're good to ha glad to have these folks here. He's our youth pastor here for s some time, and so we're glad to have him back. Um, Melody's parents are here for that. Oh, way back there. Didn't want to sit with them, huh? No? Did you shake your head no? She didn't. She said she didn't want to sit with you. You are? Not yet. Okay. Just to make sure everything's... I have an available slot after the service in my office if you need help. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer and ask God to bless in the offering today. Dear Lord, we're grateful for what you've done for us here at Liberty Baptist Church. We're praying, Father, that you'll help us just reach our budget each and every week, that we might be able to carry out the work and see souls saved. Father, we just uh, pray for your blessing to be upon our people as they give. Help them to see that you'll bless us when we give our tithes and our offerings unto you. You'll bless us as individuals, our families, our, our church, and then, Father, we become a great blessing to the missionaries and those that we support around the world. Now, have your way in this offering today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Day, we like to recognize those that have loved ones that fought and died for our country, and we like to give you an opportunity to share that with us. All those that had lost a loved one in uh, battle serving our country, why don't you stand up at this time? You have 
someone that you lost in battle fighting for the freedom that we have here in America, stand up. Anyone else? We only have more folks than that. Okay, what do you well, tell us who it was? Amen. Thank you for your loss. Let's give him a hand this morning. <laughs> Beth? Well, we thank you for his service. We thank you for your willingness to give his life that we might have freedom here in America. Amen. Give her a hand this morning. <laughs> Anyone else? Give Kevin. Your Uncle Tim. Where did he? Okay. Well, we appreciate that, brother. Let's give him a hand this morning. <laughs> Anyone else this morning? Anyone else lost a loved one? Kim. Wow. <laughs> Anyone else lose a loved one fighting, defending? Yes. You folks that lost a, a loved one, there, if you go back in the bookstore, there's a bowl there by the devotion, devotional guides, and uh, there's, some, there's a bowl filled with American flags. I want you to take one of those, okay? You can go back in the bookstore after the service today, and uh, they're right there on the left-hand side of the bookstore. There's a bowl with American, and, and with American flags, and you can have one of those. We appreciate it so very much. All right, we can go ahead and uh, remain seated on this uh, song. We're going to sing uh, page 364, Near the Cross. There's a man who lives beside me, he fought in World War II. He proudly waves old glory from high upon his roof. He starts out every morning like it's Independence Day. I've seen him at attention, salute the flag and say, I love this land from sea to shining sea. I love this land, home of the brave and free. I love the liberty, the justice, the truth on which we stand. One nation under God, I love this land. All 
all across the country in big cities little towns well mom is getting ready and dad pulls the car around they join the congregation to sing amazing grace they're free to worship jesus and they are free to pray i love this land from sea to shining sea i love this land home of the brave and free i love the liberty the justice the truth on which we stand one nation under God, I love this land. God bless America, the land I love. Oh, I will stand beside her and defend her with my life for my children, for freedom. Oh, I love this land sea to shining sea i love this land home of the brave and free i love the liberty the justice the truth on which we stand one nation under god i love this land one nation under god Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew, if you would, Matthew chapter 5. I'm preaching a series of messages on why all the suffering, and I'm going to continue that this morning. Generally, I preach special uh, sermon for Memorial Day, but I thought that uh, this message would fit right in. Sometimes suffering is for persecution, and so I think that that fits in uh, with uh, things uh, with uh, uh, the Memorial Day because we have suffered. Uh, our country has suffered and people suffer and those who gave their lives suffered and bled and died so that we could have the freedom that we do today. But why all the suffering? First of all, we looked at suffering is caused by chastening, the chastening of the Lord. But today we're going to look at number two. There are seven messages I'm preaching on this subject. Suffering is for persecution. Why all the suffering? Suffering is for persecution. In Matthew chapter 5, look at verses beginning with verse number 10. If you can stand with me, I'll read verses 10, 11, and 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Why all the suffering? Suffering sometimes is for persecution. The Bible tells us if you live godly that you will suffer persecution. The Bible says you will, not maybe but you will suffer persecution. That's what the Bible tells us here. I want us to look at this passage today as bound prayer. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that it speaks to our hearts and to our lives and gives us the truth. And dear Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand the reasons for the suffering that we face today. Of course, sometimes it's for chastening because we're not where we should be or doing what we should do for the Lord. And Father, Father, I pray that we would be in that place today. We'd be right where you want us to be. But then, dear Lord, sometimes suffering is for persecution. Sometimes we're living godly, holy lives, and things happen in our lives, and we can't understand it, but you allow that to happen, and it's for persecution's sake. Now, Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of the Word of God, save the lost here today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I was in high school, our youth pastor at our church challenged us to carry our Bibles on the top of our books when we went to school. I went to public high school. I was going to 
At that time, I was going to Grand Blanc High School there in Grand Blanc, Michigan. And our youth pastor challenged us to do that. I made a commitment that I would carry my Bible on the top of my books uh, to school every single day. And so I would do that. And uh, it wasn't so bad when I was at Grand Blanc High School, but we moved from Grand Blanc, where we lived. We were living on a farm there. We moved from the farm to, we, to uh, Silver Lake in Fenton, Michigan. And uh, when we moved there, there weren't any other students from our church that went to that high school. I was the only one that went to that high school. And it wasn't so bad, you know, when I was at Grand Blank. There were a number, Grand Blank High School, there were a number of students, and they would carry their Bibles, and we'd see each other every day. But when I went to Fenton High School, there wasn't a single person from our church that went there. I was the only one that carried my Bible on top of my books. And I didn't put it underneath my books. I put it right on top of my books. I had made that commitment to the Lord. And so I carried my Bible on top of my books. And uh, people thought that I was strange to carry my Bible to school. And, uh, but I did, and I made that commitment, and so I did every single day. And uh, when I would come by and I had my Bible and my books, they'd be whispering, you know. If they were telling dirty jokes, they would quit telling the dirty jokes. And I play, actually played on the football team. I played, it was interesting, I played football for Grand Blank High School. And then we moved to Fenton, and I played for Fenton High School. So one year, I played for Grand Blank High School against Fenton. The next year, I played for Fenton against Grand Blank. And uh, the, the coaches were asking me to, if I knew any of the plays. I said, sure, I've got all the plays. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it, it was a different story when I went to Fenton High School. Uh, and uh, they made up names. They called me Bible Billy. They said, here comes Bible Billy. They would call me that, you know, and... And I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't enjoy them calling me Bible Billy. And uh, I didn't enjoy the way that they acted towards me. And even some of my teachers in the classes, they treated me differently. If there was ever a question about the Bible, if anything was said about the Bible, everybody would look at me. And uh, they would expect me to have the answer to all the questions. And, uh, and, but, uh, they made, and they would make fun of me, especially on the football team. Uh, you know, when I'd go into the locker room and I had my Bible on top of my books, uh, some of those guys just shake their head at me, you know. And But you know what? That was just part of it. But I was willing to stand for the Lord. That was years and years ago. I don't know what in the world they'd do today. I, I don't even know if you can carry your Bible to school today and uh, because things are so changed. I know you're not allowed to... to uh, to witness and so forth. I think young people, from what I read in the laws, young people can witness in the public, public schools today. But uh, for someone else to go in there, it's another story. So you can be a witness uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. But yes, I did. That was the first time I ever suffered persecution. And that was as a teenager carrying my Bible to school with me. Uh, the year 1662, there was a preacher by the name of Henry Havers. Henry Havers preached the, preached the gospel. He went around preaching the word of God. Uh, the government was after him, and uh, the soldiers were coming after him, and they wanted to arrest him and put him in jail for preaching the word of God. He would go into areas. They would send word that he would be in, in an area, and he didn't preach in churches and places like that. But he'd preach out in the field. He'd pre preach out in the cow pastures, you know, where no one was at. He'd go into the barns and preach into the barns, and there'd always be a great group of people there waiting to hear the preaching of the Word of God. And, uh, and, uh, and so they told about this one meeting. It's a very famous story that's told about him, Henry Havers. He went... And there was a, a, a field filled with people. The people were waiting with great anticipation for him to come, but they knew they, uh, that they were risking their lives even to come to hear this man preach. And so they would come. Probably all the more would come to hear what in the world does he have to say that the soldiers, why do they want to put him in jail for, for preaching the word of God? Well, he came, and there were, uh, they say there were hundreds of people there waiting to hear him preach. Now, they would always have lookouts to make sure uh, that uh, if there were soldiers coming, then they would disperse, and they'd get Henry Havers out of there uh, because they knew that they wanted to arrest him for preaching the Word of God. Well, at this meeting, he preached, and uh, I guess it was halfway through the meeting, uh, the, the lookout saw soldiers coming. They knew that they were coming for him. 
And so they dispersed and they took him and they took him to an old uh, house, uh, an abandoned house. They took him to this house and uh, there was a passageway there and they hid him in the passageway. The soldiers came and of course they knew something was going on. Someone had given them the alarm that uh, something was going on in that place. And so they began to search the houses and they came to that old house where they hid the preacher and uh, they hid him in a, uh, a place in that house. Now, while he was hid in that passageway, a, a spider came and began to weave a web across that passageway. And when the soldiers came into that house and they began to look in all of the rooms for him, they went right by that passage. They came by the passageway and there was the spider webs. We call them cobwebs over top of that. And one of the soldiers said, there's no need for us to go in there because the cobwebs, the spider webs are undisturbed. And so they walked right by it and God preserved his life. <laughs> he said this in his diary. He quoted from Psalm 118 and verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And so and that is the truth. God will protect us and God will guide us and God will uh, help us in our lives when we're persecuted. Suffering is for persecution. Mark it down. Suffering is for persecution. You say, why is it that people in the world would persecute Christians for? Why is it? My friend, here in America, we don't see it as much as they see it in other parts of the world, but rest assured, it is going on here in America. I get the Christian alert, uh, and I get that every month. Some of you get that, and you'll see all the different instances where Christians here in America are being persecuted. And, uh, and that's just a list of the ones that they knew, know from the Christian Law Association, but it's going on all around the world. Why is it? Because the world, they don't like it that we would be different from them. They want us to be just like them. And as a result of that, it antagonizes them. When they see us as Christians and they see you leaving for church, when they saw you, you might not know it, but they were watching when you went to church today. Their neighbors looking out your window. They were peeking back. There they go. There goes those Christians again. They're going to church again. Why do they need to go to church so many times during the week? They must be wicked people. That's what they're saying about you. But they were watching. And you know, they didn't like it. Because they're going to be out to their parties. And they're going to be boozing it up tonight. And I mean, on the news, that's all they're saying is watch out on the roads. Because they're going to be boozing it up. And people are going to be hung over. And every, every, and every news uh, uh, meeting they were talking about how to deal with a hangover and all of that. I said, well, if you didn't drink, you wouldn't have a hangover, amen? Why not just not drink? But uh, no, they want to deal with it, see? But that's crazy. But uh, why? The Bible even tells us they, uh, that godliness generates hostility and, and antagonism. In John chapter 15, in verse 19, the Bible says, if ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. <laughs> doesn't say that they don't like you. What's it say? It says they hate you. <laughs> the Bible says that they hate you, and they do, because of godliness, and that's what it's talking about there. If you live a godly life, then you'll suffer persecution. I'm going to talk to you about two things today. Suffering is for persecution. Two things about suffering and persecution. Just two things that it talks about, that Jesus is talking to us about here in Matthew chapter 5. First of all, the godly will suffer persecution. Mark it down, the godly will suffer persecution. There, look at verses 10 and 11 in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Jesus is telling his disciples if they follow him, he's saying, listen, if you follow me, you're going to suffer persecution if you follow me. If you follow me, if you live godly, then you're going to suffer persecution. He's telling them that. He said, when, notice what he says, when men shall revile you. When. He's not if, not if, but when. 
you are going to suffer persecution, the Bible tells us. Be ready when it comes. That's what he's saying. Be ready when it comes. Of course, you know, 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you live godly, if you live for the Lord, if you follow after Him, you mark it down, you're going to be persecuted. You will be persecuted. The Bible tells us that. Now, there are three major kinds of persecution that we will face, and Jesus gives them to us here in this passage. First of all, in verse number 11, there will be verbal insults. There will be verbal insults. Men shall revile you. The word revile means to use abusive language against you. They will revile you. They will use abusive language against you. They will use verbal insults against you. If you're a Christian, you've been living for the Lord for some time, you already know what I'm talking about. I saw some of you nodding your head. You already know what I'm talking about. They have done it. They will do it. They will continue to do it. They will cuss you out. They will swear at you. Listen, Jesus himself suffered it. Remember when they took Jesus falsely, uh, uh, arrested him, took him from the Garden of Gethsemane, stood him before the Sanhedrin. My friend, he was, uh, again, they, uh, they uh, reviled him there in that place. The Bible tells us that they taunted him. Matthew chapter 26, verses 67 and 68. Then did they spit in his face and buffet him, and others smote him with, their, with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? They were making fun of him. They were insulting him. They spit upon him. They smote him. That's our Savior they did that to. He didn't do anything, amen? He was perfectly sinless. And yet that's what they did to him. I think to myself, if they would do that to Jesus and he was absolutely sinless, just think of what they'll do to us, amen? And what they do to us. They will. And they do. Jesus without, without sin. I have, back in my office, uh, several filing cabinets back there, uh, but I have a file in my filing cabinet, one file in my filing cabinet that has abuse. Just when I've been abused and when people have sent dirty letters to me, you think, why do they send them to you? They send dirty letters. I, I get terrible letters. And you know what? I used to, I had a thick file, I threw them away, I, and, I, and I just started throwing them away, but I talked with a policeman, and uh, an officer, and he said, don't throw those away. He said, you need to keep them for a, a length of time, because if those people ever come back and do some of the things that they threaten you with, then you'll need to have that letter. You need to have that letter. And so I keep it. I never look at those letters, let me tell you. I, I, generally, I'll get a letter, and sometimes it doesn't have a return address on it. It'll just have to pastor I'm there, Liberty Baptist Church, and generally, I'm almost afraid to open that letter up. And sometimes, uh, at, at times, I'll tell you what Pastor Dan has done. If Pastor Dan and Jackie, if they get to that, those letters before I get to them, they'll open them up so I don't have to see what, the, what it says. Because some of them are nasty. They'll use curse words and all kinds of things in there. But I've got some in there. Or people are telling us uh, what they're going to do to us just for being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that terrible? But that's going on right here. They'll use verbal insults against you. They'll use verbal insults against us. They'll use, number two, another way that Jesus says that they persecute us is by physical persecution. In verse number 11, the Bible says, and persecute you. You know the word persecute there literally means they will try to hurt you. <laughs> the word there means that they're going to try to hurt you. They want to hurt you. And uh, that's what it says. Physically hurt you. You say, has that ever happened? Well, uh, we're in a spiritual warfare, aren't we? We're in a spiritual warfare. I've had, Mar Martha and I were out witnessing one day, just going door to door. We went on this, we were on this one doorstep, knocked on the door, we were witnessing, uh, and we were just going to pass some tracks out and witness to this, whoever came to the door, and I told the guy who we were, and he just yelled and, and started cursing at my wife and I and told us to get out of there. I said, you don't have to tell me twice, brother, you know what, you don't have to tell me twice. 
And so we started walking down. We walked off the, pla- off the porch. We were walking down the sidewalk. There's a straight sidewalk in front of the house. We were walking down the sidewalk. All of a sudden, I heard cursing and swearing. And this guy came out of the house, came running out of the house, and ran, running after me, and was going to kick me. He's going to kick me in the seat of the pants. That's what he's going to do. But when he went to kick, his back foot slipped out from underneath him, and he fat, fell flat like that on the, on the sidewalk. There's no question that God slapped him down. And that guy, he was still cursing when he's laying down, cursing. Did I go and help him up? I didn't go and help him up. I didn't. I just let him curse and curse and curse right there on the... And I went and got in my car and left. <laughs> I'm not stupid. (laughs) But God took care of that guy. There's no question. Because you know what? I wouldn't have seen that guy. I heard him him fall on the ground. You know, I wouldn't have seen him. He didn't kick me. God, God saved my life. God saved me. It's been that way from the beginning. The early Christians. You read, how many have read Fox's Book of Martyrs? You ought to read that book. Every Christian ought to read that book. I don't know if we have any back in our uh, bookstore or not. Do we have any of those back there? There may be. It. You, you ought to go back. You ought to get one of those and read that book because you'll read about the, the, what the Christians went through. Do you know that Nero would stone Christians to death? Would have, if you were a Christian, he'd have you stoned to death. Not only that, but here's some things that you probably don't even realize. They would tar. They would put tar all over a Christian. And then they would light them on fire. Here's another thing that they would do. You know what they would do? They would take animal skins and put them, wrap them around the Christian, and then put them into a pit with hunting dogs and let the dogs maul them to death. From the beginning, we also have a book back there, The Trail of Blood. The Trail of Blood. It follows Christians from the beginning, from Christ's time until today, uh, until the, the uh, New Testament days, it, uh, until today. It shows where the churches all came, and it shows how Christians suffered from, from the time of Christ, how they suffered. And that's why they call it the trail of blood, because of Christians being put to death. For the cause of Christ. You ought to look at that book. I think we may have some of those back there as well. Martyrs for Christ. That's another. That's a, that's a magazine that comes out. I, I used to get that magazine. And that, that Martyrs for Christ magazine tells about people that are being martyred for the cause of Christ today. We don't even hear about that stuff. Our news media, they're not going to put that on the news, are they? They're not going to put that on the news. Physical persecution. Then, so we have verbal insults. We have physical persecution. Number three, Jesus talks about false accusations. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. There in verse number 11. These are personal attacks they will levy against you. But by the time you find out about them, my friend, your reputation has already been hurt. You know what? They will come after you. They will talk about you. They will say all manner of things against you. They will slander you. They will discredit you. They did the same thing to Jesus. What did they call Jesus? They called him gluttonous. They called him a wine-bibber, a drunkard. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Jesus was sinless. What was he? Why? How could they accuse him? My friend, but they did it anyway. False. I'm saying the Bible says false accusations are going to levy against you. They will. You're going to be persecuted. The Bible says you will be persecuted. If you live for the Lord, you will be persecuted. When I was an assistant pastor... We were having a picnic. We we're going to have a picnic after our service this morning. We were having a picnic after a church service, and um, the people were all gathered. All the people were gathered. We were actually uh, we didn't have a building to meet in a gym like we have right now, but the people were all gathered out, and we had tables all set up and so forth. 
And there was a fellow out there, and the fellow was smoking. And so the pastor told me to go and ask this fellow if he wouldn't put away his smoking, put away cigarettes, because we, we're having a church picnic. And so I'm just a young young assistant pastor, a young preacher. I, I thought, well, how am I going to say this? And so I thought about it, and I tried to say it in a pleasing way, but it didn't matter what I said. That guy got so mad. He flicked his cigarette at me, and he said, I'm going to kill you if I ever see you again. He said, I will kill you. And then he ran, got in his car, and laid rubber all the way out the church parking lot and rubber down the road. Now, the, you know what he did? He, he left his whole family there. <laughs> Pastor said, who's going to take him home? I said, not me. <laughs> I said, the fact is, I'm never going to that neighborhood again. <laughs> I know where that neighborhood is up in Braden, and I still haven't been back there. People can get mad enough to do anything. I was just watching the traffic out here this morning. I was telling my Sunday school class right here at the corner of Bay of Vista and Nectos. I was just watching the traffic out there today. The horns were blowing like crazy out there. People have no patience, do they? You will be persecuted if you live for the Lord. You will be. The Bible tells us you will be. John Wesley, he was the founder of the Methodist Church. A lot of people don't know this, but John Wesley was actually led to the Lord by some Anabaptists, Moravian Anabaptists. On a ship, actually, he was coming to America on a missionary trip, and he wasn't even saved. How about that? <laughs> and he was led to the Lord by some Anabaptists. They led him to the Lord, and he got saved, came over here, and was a missionary to the Indians, actually, is what he was. But John Wesley, one day he was riding on his horse. And uh, he realized that no one had thrown any rocks at him or cursed at him. And he thought to himself, something must be wrong. I must be backslidden. <laughs> Nobody has thrown any rocks at me or cursed at me. And so he tells how he got off his horse and got down on his knees next to his horse and started praying, repenting. <laughs> he said, surely I must have done something wrong. I must have sinned if no one's cursing at me or uh, persecuting me in some way. So while he was down on his knees praying, and he was praying out loud, there was a man over in the bushes, and this man over in the bushes picked up a brick and threw it at him. <laughs> and the brick... John Wesley gives his tales about this. The brick fell next to him. He missed. The brick missed. And John Wesley looked over, saw the brick down there, and he said, praise the Lord, I'm in the presence of God. <laughs> I'm still in the presence of the Lord. Because <laughs> you know what? You will suffer persecution, won't you? You will, the Bible says. The godly will suffer persecution. That's number one. The second point is the godly who suffer persecution will be rewarded. Number one, you will suffer persecution. Number two, the godly who suffer persecution will be rewarded. Look at verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, you're going to be persecuted. He said, but when you are persecuted, rejoice and be exceeding glad. He didn't tell them when you're persecuted, go run and hide in a cave someplace or go run to your house and lock the door. He didn't tell them to do that. He says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? Because we have been saved to serve the Lord. Amen? We're not here to run and hide someplace or to hide in a cave or to hide behind a house or to hide someplace. We have been called to serve the Lord. We have a job to do, and we need to serve the Lord. The Bible tells us that's what we're here for. In John chapter 17, verses 14 through 18, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they were not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray 
not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent also them into the world. Listen, we have been sent into the world. We are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We have, we're here for a reason. So we're not to go hide someplace, my friend. Uh, you say, well, and some people I, I know, they, get, they think, I've had people say this, why don't we go someplace on a deserted island, have our own community so people won't persecute us. But that's not what the Bible told us to do. We're supposed to be out in the world. We're supposed to be giving the gospel out, even though they will persecute us. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That's what he said. Don't hide. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 15 and 16. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We're to be the salt of the earth. We're to be the light of the world. Give the gospel out. When we become Christ's salt and we become his light then when we give out the gospel salt will sting a sore <laughs> we give the gospel out they're not going to like it and they'll persecute us what happens when uh, you come from the darkness into the light your eyes are irritated by the light my friend, we are the light of the world. When we give out the light and we give out the truth, what does it do? It irritates the world, amen? They're coming out of the darkness, and it irritates them. And so they will persecute us. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, listen, rejoice and be exceeding glad. You know what? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, what that means? It means to jump up and down, jump up and down with joy. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. What in the world? When they persecute us, jump up and down with joy? Yes. We're being persecuted for Christ's sake. It's not us. They're coming after us, but it's the Lord they're coming after. Amen? We're in a spiritual warfare. The devil doesn't like Christ. He's going to do everything he can against Christ that he possibly can, and that's why he attacks us. He's coming after us. He's coming after you. But Christ says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Not only that, but the Bible tells us that we'll be rewarded for the persecution that we suffer here in this earth. For Christ's sake, the Bible tells us. We will uh, receive rewards in heaven. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 17, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. He said, I'm suffering for Christ's sake. When we suffer, when I was a teenager and I put my Bible on top of my books and I walked through the halls of Fenton High School and people mocked me and made fun of me, you know what? It was... Christ was being glorified by that. Amen. It was Christ that they were coming after. Jesus gives us two reasons here for rejoicing and being glad. Two reasons. First of all, we should rejoice and be exceeding glad because great is your reward in heaven, the Bible says in verse number 12. Great is your reward in heaven. First of all, we get to go to heaven. Amen. <laughs> we get to go to heaven. Boy, that's great. Heaven. Heaven. <laughs> we get to go there. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. But heaven's eternal. Not only do we get to go to heaven, rejoice because we get to go to heaven, but rejoice because heaven's eternal. <laughs> Forever. It's eternal. This life is very short, isn't it? The Bible says it's like a vapor in James chapter 4 and verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then vanisheth away. Life is short, isn't it? 
Time goes by so quickly. Just quick. I was at Devin's, Devin's graduation the other night, and I, I just, I was thinking about him. Here he comes marching by me in his graduation robe, you know, and uh, I just, I think of him when he's just a little boy. One of the things I think about him is he could play chess when he's a little boy. He'd play, he'd bring his chess game over. He could play two people at one time. I think of that little guy, and now look at this big old guy. This brings tears to my eyes, you know. I say, oh, man, is it, that time has gone by so quickly. I remember going to his brother's graduation. That was just like four years ago that I went to his graduation, the military academy. I think, wow, the time goes by so quickly. Life is so short. This world is, time is quickly but heaven is forever this is nothing <laughs> it's nothing compared to heaven it's forever Did you notice what he says there great is your reward in heaven heaven eternity and then he adds and he didn't even have to add this but he put great is your reward in heaven <laughs> he said great we get to go to heaven, it's eternal, and our rewards are great. Isn't that a big deal? <laughs> when the Lord says it, it's a big deal. Great. He didn't have to say that. Heaven would have been enough, amen? Eternity. But he says it's great. Great is your reward. Wow. Great is your reward in heaven. That's why he can say rejoice, be exceeding glad. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You say, but oh, pastor, uh, should we... Say anything about those rewards we're going to get in heaven? Why not? The Lord is the one that's talking about them, amen? <laughs> I think we can go after those rewards. Yeah, we should serve the Lord because we love him, but you know there's nothing wrong with getting rewards when we get to heaven, amen? I'm glad for that. We will be rewarded in heaven. I think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people become too self-righteous about this area. You say, should we look forward to those rewards? I think so. Why? Because of this verse. Jesus was looking forward to the joy that was set before him. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Look what it says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If Jesus can look forward to that, I can too. Amen? Yep. Yes, we should. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, we have something to look forward to. Heaven, eternity, great rewards. <laughs> can motivate us to serve the Lord and continue. Whatever it takes to motivate you to serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. I was reading about a dear lady who was dying. She was in the poorhouse. Years ago, here in this country, they had what was called poorhouses. Some of you, can you remember the poorhouses? If they had no place else to go, they called them poorhouses. People that didn't have any family, didn't have anyone to take care of them, didn't have any money, they would go to the poorhouse. There was a lady, she was in the poorhouse. She's a Christian, she's in the poorhouse, she's dying. The doctor came to see her. And she is rejoicing in the Lord. <laughs> she's in the poorhouse. She's dying. She's rejoicing. And the doctor said to her, he said, what do you have to rejoice about? You're in the poorhouse and you're dying. She said, well, I've got a lot to rejoice about. 
She said, I'm in the poor house and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> going from the poor house to heaven. Boy, that's a lot, amen? That's something to rejoice in. And we can rejoice. So first of all, he says rejoice and be exceeding glad because great is your reward in heaven. Then notice the second thing he says there. Rejoice and be exceeding glad because so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're not the first one to be persecuted. You're not the first one. There were others before you. Jesus is telling his disciples this. He's telling us this. He's saying, listen, there were others before you that were persecuted. James chapter 5 and verse 10, the Bible says, Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Elijah, they called him old bald head. Amos, they uh, banished him from the land. Jeremiah, they put him into a prison, and this prison was down in a hole. It wasn't like prison like we think. They would dig a big hole in the ground, and, and uh, they would put him, drop him down into this hole. And it'd be all, and he talks about the mud and the muck down there, and he was down in the muck and in the mire of that jailhouse, they would drop the food down through a hole in the top. That's where Jeremiah was for preaching the word of God, for standing for righteousness. Daniel was thrown into a den of lions. They were persecuted for God, for the Lord. If you read the Mar uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, you read about the Spanish Inquisition. Do you know in the Spanish Inquisition... There were 300 to 400,000 Christians that were put to death, tortured. Three to 400,000 were standing for the Lord. There was a Baptist preacher by the name of uh, Obadiah Holmes, 1651 in Massachusetts. He was arrested for holding a prayer meeting in his house. The governor of Massachusetts, Governor Endicott, had him arrested. They tied him to a beating pole and they beat him with whips. And while they were beating him with whips, he said, you're whipping me with roses. That's what he said. You're whipping me with roses. For the cause of Christ, he was doing that. You're not the only one that suffered persecution from family, from friends, from so-called religious institutions or religious people. The New Testament apostles, the apostles that served the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, they all suffered for the cause of Christ. James was hung on a cross with bands. Peter was hung on a cross upside down. He refused to be hung the same way that Christ was hung. John was uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Paul, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, was beheaded by Nero. All for the cause of Christ. Sometimes we think it's hard to serve the Lord. Do you think it's hard to serve the Lord? <laughs> We need to serve the Lord. If, if you serve the Lord, you will suffer persecution. But you will be rewarded for it. Amen? You will be rewarded. Heaven, eternity, great rewards, the Bible tells us. Pastor told how he was preaching and Simon, uh, preaching a message, Simon the Cyrene that helped bear the cross of Christ and he asked the congregation, he asked this question, would you be willing to bear the cross of Christ? Would you be willing to bear the cross of Christ? It was a, a question, a rhetorical question. In other words, you just get you to think about it. Would you be willing to bear the cross of Christ? But there was one little boy who was a bus kid, and he raised his hand and said, I will, I will, <laughs> I'll do it. One little boy. 
and everybody kind of snickered, just kind of you sneered at him. You know, <laughs> that little guy, look at that. Huh. The pastor told how the very next week that little boy came to church and the pastor patted him on the shoulder and when he patted him on the shoulder, the boy jumped. He says, what's, what's the matter? He said, I don't want to say. He said, no, son, what's the matter? He said, my mother beat me for coming to church, but I came back, pastor. That little boy that they snickered and sneered at. He's willing to suffer for Jesus. Are we willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? Are we willing? What are we willing to do for Christ? If you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you will suffer. There was a preacher by the name of John Chrysostom. He lived in the 4th century. He was arrested for preaching the word. And he was brought before the emperor. And the emperor said... To John Chrysostom, he said, If you don't stop preaching the word, if you don't recant your faith, then I'm going to banish you from the land. John Chrysostom looked up at him and he said, You can't banish me from the land. He said, Because all of the land belongs to the Lord. <laughs> he said, Then I will kill you. He said, You can't kill me. Because I'm hid with Christ in God. You can't threaten me with heaven. He said, then I will drive away so you won't have all of your friends. You won't have any friends. He said, you can't do that either because my greatest friend is in heaven. Jesus is my greatest friend. So they did take him and put him on a ship and they first took him to Armenia and then they took him to the uh, Pythias on the Black Sea. And on the way there, he died. But the things that he valued most, they could not take from him. And as Christians, the things that we value most, the world cannot take from us. Why all the suffering? Sometimes it's for persecution. Let's bow our heads, every head bowed, every eye closed. Sometimes it's for persecution. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're in our places. First of all,